Thank you, Ahmedabad. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, I am extremely, extremely honored to get this platform to talk about the history of Indian food. And I'm going to talk about it through my book, Whose Samosa Is It Anyway? This is a book I recently wrote. So the earth mass is like a couple that is constantly breaking up and patching up. It all starts with Rodina, which is a supercontinent that existed about 175 million years ago. And a break in the continent led to, it was called the Pangaea, and a break in it led to two large continents known as Laurasia, which had North America, Europe, Asia, and Gondwana. And uh, the Central Indian tribe Gondwana gets its name from this region. Now you will ask me, how is this relevant to the history of Indian food? Uh, this is just to say that before, uh, before India became the India that we know, the shape and form of India that we know, lots of geological features were taking place on the mass of Earth. They are happening now and they will continue to happen. So this brings me to my first question, what is Indian food? I began the research for my book, Who's Samosa Is It Anyway, in the Indus Valley. Sorry, you'll have to do, make do with uh, Flintstones because we don't have an Indus Valley cartoon yet. Um, around 6000 BC, the Indian subcontinent mainly consisted of three kinds of people. These were the early Indians. The South Asian hunters and gatherers who were the oldest inhabitants of the subcontinent. Iranian agriculturists possibly bringing with them certain forms of cultivation like wheat, pulses and barley because before that we were all hunters and gatherers. And lastly, one migration happened from the steppe pastoralist. These are people from the Volga and Don River Valley and loosely referred to as the Aryans and they came from the Russia. Okay. The role of agriculture. One of the earliest documented experiments in agriculture can be found in a village at the foot of Bolan Pass, which is current day Baluchistan. This was called Mehergar. Fossils of seeds such as emma, einkorn, wheat and barley were found in this region, making these indigenous, ind indigenously Indian crops. And domesticated animal bones included sheep, goat, water buffalo, zebu cattle. In fact, water buffalo and zebu cattle are two of the largest animal remains found on Indian excavation sites. How did the Indus Valley came about? As you know, Indus Valley is the largest Indian civilization. And how did this come about? Indus is one of the four most important civilizations in the world, the others being Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and the Yellow River Valley civilization. Mehergar paved a way for the Indus civilization to flourish, and smaller villages of Mehergar started getting abandoned for larger Indus cities, and that's how the full fledged Indus Valley came into being. This is the most interesting question, what did they eat? So of course if there was man, he ate something. We had moved on from a hunting and gathering stages and we were eating something, so what were we eating? According to a research that was conducted by two scientists, Anurima Kashyap and Steve Weber in 2010, and they, this report was published on BBC, they did a starch analysis of the molecules gathered from the utensils and tools found on excavation sites. Dental, animal, dental enamel of animals and humans was also researched and here's what they found. This happened at a site in Farmana in India. They pieced together a recipe of the remains. The, the starch analysis revealed certain ingredients that were found on all these remains and they pieced together a recipe which is known as the proto curry or the first curry that Indians ate. Now of course we get irritated with people referring to our cuisine as curry cuisine. But, this, but we did eat curry and uh, it was, this is the proto curry and it had aubergine, uh, turmeric, ginger and salt which, which means that these were indigenously Indian ingredients. It didn't have chilies and it didn't have paneer and it didn't have uh, tomatoes. Uh, the impact of religion. This is the second thing that helped me piece together his, the history of Indian food. How did religion impact Indian food? So I've divided the food references that I found in religious texts into three major religions of India. The first is Jainism. Firstly, vegetables like potato, carrot, radish are not mentioned in ancient Jain scriptures at all. In Agamas, which are Jain religious texts, I found ingredients like Hirila, Shirila, Shir Viradri, Feluti, Podval, Sheval. Of course, we don't know about these ingredients because they may have become uh, you know, extinct over time. 
but some recognizable foods from that time were ginger, garlic, honey, figs, ghee, neem, jaggery, oil, confirming that these are all indigenously Indian. Now a little information about what was eaten during Buddha's time uh, could be found, but he certainly did not eat this. Now what we know as the Buddha wool, he did not eat this. Uh, research from this time brings about that as Prince Gautama, Buddha ate, like that time he was Prince Gautama, not Buddha yet, he ate high quality meals in, in his palace and these included long grain rice, barley cakes, ghee, curd, butter, a variety of meats known as beef, goat, fowl, venison, freshwater fish, pork and even liqueur. But once on his path to enlightenment, all these food habits changed and Buddha used to eat jujube, sesame cakes, sometimes even one grain of rice. Contrary to, contrary to popular belief, uh, certain forms and schools of Buddhism still allow people to eat meat as long as it's certified that the meat was not cut for the monk and it already was cut. Lastly, Hinduism. To say I've gone through various um, Hindu scriptures ranging from translations of Mahabharat, Ramayana, Vedas and found a whole bunch of ingredients for which you'll have to buy and read my whole book. Uh, one of the few interesting texts that I found was in Paka Darpana. Paka Darpana is actually the earliest uh, Hindu cookbook that you will ever find. This was written by King Nala whose story is told in the Mahabharata. His cookbook had a dish called Supa which is made out of lentils and he says, Nala says in his book and he instructs the cook to garnish it with edible flowers. Now we may think edible flowers is such a modern Indian thing but it's not because Paka, uh, in Paka Darpana there is a recipe that says to be garnished with edible uh, flowers. This book also has uh, certain techniques in which Nala instructed his cook how to chop certain things, how to cook certain things and it's extremely detailed just like a modern cookbook. The next thing that impacted Indian food was Indian royalty. My chapter on Indian royalty talks about Indian food influences mentioned in literature from the period of the Nandas, the Mauryas, the Pallavas, the Cholas and the Vijayanagar Empire. I found a lot of food references in Mano Solasa, a Sanskrit text written by King Someshwar Deva and found certain habits of the Chalukya kings during that period. Now this is where Bahubali the film comes from. This is where Kantara is based, coastal Karnataka. But we are going to be talking about the Chalukya Empire. Yeah. Uh, Kalyani, Kalyani Chalukya King Someshwar Deva wrote Mano Solasa. In his book, I found references of dish like, like Vatika, which could be an early adaptation of the Dahi Vada, because Dahi was very much existing in that kitchen. There is also a 12th century idli known as Idrika and also instructions of flying a black rat. To say and to, uh, to other empires that impacted Indian cuisine and added to Indian cuisine were the Marathas, Sindhyas, Rajputs and others. But no one changed the, changed the face of Indian cuisine like the Central Asian invasions that happened in India. This is when dishes like jalebi, faluda, biryani, naan, gulab jamun, pulao, all this came into Indian cuisine. And this brings me to the title of my book, Who's Samosa Is It Anyway? This is what I found. And I, I urge you all to quickly read this. Traders and conquerors. The next chapter talks about how trading and certain conquerors that came to India impacted Indian food. While everyone credits Vasco da Gama for becoming the first explorer to reach India by sea, there has been a steady trade happening in the world since the time of Indus Valley. This is why old Mesopotamian coins are found on the Indus site and vice versa. However, we have to credit influences coming from Portuguese, Chinese, Dutch, French, English who changed the way in which Indians ate. 
These influences gave us ingredients like watermelon, roses, tamarind, sag, almond, cumin, coffee, tea, guava, papaya, chiku, paneer, oranges, lychees, and so much more because these didn't exist in Indian food until trade started happening, until people came and colonized Indian land. brings me to the concluding chapter of my book, what we created after these ingredients once the Britishers left. Pre and post independence, food choices were influenced by what national leaders ate and championed. For example, Gandhi talks about converting to vegetarianism. His food choices were not just dietary but also made a political statement. It was very interesting that he gave off sugar, chocolate and these were linked to the protesting happening on the uh, and slave labour. Um, he used to be against slave labor, imperialism on plantations and that's why he gave up all these things. Gandhi was vegan, he went off sugar, he practiced fasting, basically he was a woke Gen Z. <laughs> While Nehru invested in Moti Mahal in Delhi, the restaurant that is still present in Delhi, he had invested in it. Tagore appeared on food ads, including the Bormita one, he wrote copy for Lipton tea. Was he India's first food influencer? It's something I'd like you all to think about. Now we move on to talk about where Indian food is now. Post-liberalization, India also experienced a change in media ownership and so the monopoly of broadcasting shifted from the government to private players. This was only in 1992 that ZTV, India's first private entertainment channel, launched in Hindi. In the second year, they launched a cooking show called Khana Khazana with Sanjeev Kapoor as the face of it. Can you guess the three words that he said? Anyone? There you go. <laughs> A hundred influences later, we come to the last slide for today. I'm going to conclude by reading the last para from my book. Redefining Indian cuisine right now are modern Indian restaurants like Indian Accent, Mask, Bombay Canteen, O Pedro, Zia, Avartana. Each restaurant here is redefining generic understanding of Indian cuisine and there are a few points that tie them together. These restaurants refuse to cow down to preset rules of Indian food. While there's ample respect for roots and recipes, no experiment is high risk enough. This is not the first time in Indian history that diners are at a brink of colossal shift in their attitude towards Indian food, but this is definitely that time for my generation. Thank you.